The 417 Gamers is a group of board, tabletop, and card gamers in the 417 area code. This is the podcast. Welcome to the 417 Gamer Podcast, episode 14, Expansion! In the 4, Andrea and I will discuss four things we've been enjoying in the 417 area, or what we're looking forward to in December. In the one topic of the week, we discuss and review Beacon Patrol. Do we like Beacon Patrol? Well, we posted enough pictures about it. And in the 7, Greg Pullman, a.k.a. Queen City Cardboard, comes back on, and we make him tell us what his favorite seven games are. Well, we didn't really make him. He, he, he enjoys talking about games. Without further ado, welcome to the 417 Gamer Podcast. Welcome to the 417 Gamers. My name is Rick. And I'm Andrea. The 4 and the 417 Gamers, especially in the expansion episode, we discuss four things that we've either enjoyed or are looking forward to in the 417 area. I'm going to start us off with Black Friday Game Day. Myself, Andrea, and a couple friends got together last year, and we played through all of Capstone's Iron Rail series, which was... Irish Gage, Ride the Rails, and Iberian Gage. It was a good time, and we had another group of friends that were had the same idea, playing a different game at the table over, and theirs was a nice, big, long game day. And we're like, you know what? We should just make this an annual tradition. You know, we're all with their families on Thanksgiving, and I love my families, but as much as they ask me, why don't we play more games? When I suggest the games, they're kind of like, I'm kind of full. So, Andrea, we decided to... Go to Meta and enjoy playing some games. Yeah! So, this will take place at Meta Games Unlimited on... I think it's the 26th? Well, it's the day after Thanksgiving. It, yes, it's Black Friday. It's the day after Thanksgiving from 11 a.m. And we officially uh, are out of there at 4 p.m., Although, if people wanted to stay later, I think Meta Games would be more than happy to have them. Well, another good thing about being at Meta on Black Friday is they have a giant Black Friday sale. Mm -hmm. And it's not just the games they have in their general um, retail. They also have some specialized vendors that come in and set up booths and sell their custom wares. true. You know, additional dice type things. There's... Uh, Yield Laser Smith, and then there's Grimbeard Leather, and some other vendors um, that you can buy their stuff at a discount as well. So you can take a break in between your games, check out some shopping, get some good Christmas gifts. Another bonus to the game day. It's almost like a mini, mini, mini con because Meta Games does have their library of, I want to say, fifty, not quite a hundred, some odd games that you're more than welcome to check out while you're at Meta Games. But like you said, they have some deep discounts. They have some vendors, craft vendors that come in. It's a really, really good time. So if you're in the 417 area, it is November 24th, 11 a.m. until 4 p.m., Black Friday game day. Andrea, I heard you went to Bentonville, Arkansas. Well, I heard that you went with me. <laughs> That's true. And we went to see the North Forest Lights. It's at the Crystal Bridges Museum and it is, it's beautiful. It is uh, the public park walkway that they have an artist come in and do little lighted exhibits. Um, it's about a mile and a half walking trail. And there are about seven exhibits that you stop at each one. And they're a different interactive uh, exhibit. For one, there are sensors where you send inside of... Basically, it's a giant metal robot with lights for the head, arms, uh, legs, and it tracks your movements, and the spotlights um, come out and are directed by your body movements. Uh, there's another one where there are over 3,000 lights to the walkway, and you put your hand under a sensor, and the lights will pulse and match up to your own heartbeat. Um, which you can hear your heartbeat and see the pulse of the lights. There are several of these type exhibits. Um, it's 
it's it's magical. It's like being in Narnia. It's such a, a beautiful experience. There are um, so many people there, but it's not overcrowded. No. Um, each station, you have to wait your turn, obviously, um, to do the interactive portion. Or if you don't want to, you can just walk through and enjoy the lights. of. And you can people watch others doing it. Because yeah. there is some performance aspects to a couple of the different stations. Yeah. Uh, this is it's officially called the Listening Forest by Rafael La, uh, Lozano Hammer, and he's an artist that does a lot of performative and, and uh, light and sound based art. Mm -hmm. uh, we were told by one of the directors that he had a display where. During shutdown, he has family and friends on both sides of El Paso and Juarez, uh, El Paso, Texas, and Juarez, Mexico, where they couldn't cross because of shutdown. But what he did was set it up to where you could put your uh, heartbeat, and that's what the sensors are from this, and your family member on the opposite side would send theirs back. And it would coordinate with the, there were giant spotlights that would shine over the Rio Grande River. And so that the, you could see them on the other side of the river. Yeah. And they have some very similar spotlights set up um, at the exhibit where um, in one area of the exhibit, you can put your hands on it and it'll um, monitor your heartbeat. And then uh, about halfway through the exhibit is the other set of lights and they crisscross in the sky. It's really cool. It is really cool. But uh, there's, what was it, the Arkansas text stream. You walk down the path, and as you're walking, there are letters that just that are kind of shown. The, the, there are spotlights that have letters that are kind of randomly coming in, and then all of a sudden you'll see words start forming. As you walk through, you kind of kick the lighted letters on your path. It was, it's a really cool experience. It was, and I still, I understand how the spotlight shined the letters on the ground, mm -hmm. and it looked like a river of letters, but somehow they make it to where, um, if you like kick your foot, like the letters scatter, like leaves. It's really cool. Yeah. We went to the previous version of the Listening Forest. Yes. Where it had the Whispering Tree and the Hearth and so many other exhibits. And we thought that was amazing when we saw that. Mm -hmm. And if you got to see the older stuff, this has completely changed. This is more than enough reason to go back. And we talked to some friends and they kind of thought it, it on the surface, it sounds like a pricey ticket because it's, it's like $30 a person. But honestly, it's an experience you can't, I mean, we're describing it, but it's hard to describe. It is. Because you're, it's, it's sight, it's sound, it's touch, uh, it's the smells of the forest. I mean, you're... It's it, completely interactive. Yes. So. We recommend it highly. Absolutely. So, that's a great one that we enjoyed. One thing we're looking forward to is Geekmas 2023. This is put on by Hawk. Fanatics and the fan, fans and um, the Drew Lewis Foundation. This is going to be taking place at the Fairbanks on the north side of Springfield, December 2nd and 3rd. Um, if you were looking for a last-minute vendor table, can uh, contact Hawk and see if he has anything left. Otherwise, if you're going to attend, it's absolutely free. Mm -hmm. They're going to have holiday-themed cosplay contests, there's going to be raffles, games, and, and and more. It's like a little tiny mini Comic Con with an overall Christmas vibe. Yep. Um, we do a lot of our last minute Christmas shopping there. Like if we haven't found something, just the perfect little thing that's unique, something you can't find on Amazon, homemade, you know, very unique to the geeky, nerdy culture. This is a great place to check it out. Especially little stocking stuffers. You have a lot of craftspeople that do the bigs, the mids, and the smalls. Mm -hmm. And again, it's free for attendees and free to enter the costume contest as well. Yeah. 
And I believe they're giving away a, a PS5 this year. I think so, if, if uh, Ock was right. And then the fourth thing, Andrea, we are looking forward to is... The Metagames Christmas Party. It is going to be on... Saturday, December 9th at 4 p.m. But how do you get in? Well, um, before the event, you'll just need to stop by Metagames and purchase a, a game or a game-related item uh, with a value of, I believe it's 20 At least $25. $25 or up. And then they put your uh, number on it, and they wrap it in a plain brown bag and put it under the Christmas tree. And at the Christmas party, it's Dirty Santa. You'll get your number called. You'll go up. You'll open a gift. And people have the option to steal it. And the way they steal it is by giving money. Five um, bucks. Five dollars a steal or more. And all of the proceeds that they collect from those steals go to the... Ozark Food Harvest. Nice. And Which is a great local charity that provides meals for the less fortunate. Absolutely. And I believe last year that they collected, <laughs> uh, what was it, almost $2,000? Oh, no, it was more. Uh, it, it, was, was so, it, was, it was so much more. Well, not so much more. I want to say they got over three or four. Yeah. So, Metagames, I mean, not only does is everybody buying at least a $25 gift to this thing, Metagames always seeds a couple big prizes. Yes. Last year, they opened their vault, and they had some commander decks that nobody had seen sealed for quite some time. Mm -hmm. One was a six-pack of those suckers, and... There was one go where that specific thing made $600 on stealing in one round. Yeah. Uh, and then there was a, another one that was a complete set for Warhammer 40K, plus the little vehicle that went with whatever that faction was. Mm -hmm. and, and the war the war gamers went after that back and forth. So much so that some of us Henri board gamers decided to... Steal it for just a period, and that way they could come back and try and steal more. <laughs> but no, it's a fantastic time. If you're in the 417 area and you want to do something for the, the, the holidays. And everybody goes home with a game. Yes. Um, if your gift gets stolen, you'll just go up and open another gift, um, and we repeat the process. So everyone goes home with something, and it's so much fun. It's always a great time. Those are the four things that we are either looking forward to or we enjoyed in the 417 area. But I think we've got a review coming up. We do. Let's get in with that. You're listening to the 417 Gamer Podcast. If you'd like to follow the 417 Gamer group, go to Facebook at facebook.com forward slash 417 gamers. There's a sign-up tab. Hit that, come over, and join the 417 Gamer group. Play games! Also, you can follow the 417 Gamers on Instagram, at 417 Gamers. Now, topic of the episode. The one in the 417 Gamers is the topic of the episode, and in this topic, we're going to do another game review. One game we've been playing the heck out of is Miss Andrea... Beacon Patrol. Yes, this is published by Pandasaurus Games. It is designed by Torben Ratzlaff, and he's also the artist on this game. Mm. Uh, in Beacon Patrol, you are captains of the Coast Guard. Together, you check beacons, buoys, and lighthouses to make sure that they are safe for the North Coast or the North Sea Coast. You place your tiles next to other tiles that are already laid out, and you move your ships and explore the sea. Your goal is to explore as many tiles as possible. Uh, a tile is considered explored when it is connected to other tiles on all four of its orthogonal sides. Uh, Beacon Patrol is a cooperative game. And I know some people in our group are very much against, or some are super pro, cooperative games. Mm -hmm. But whenever we review the games... We do uh, five criteria. We do presentation. How does it look on the shelf versus how does it look on the table and sell itself? Components. How nice are the components in your hand? And 
Is the rule book easy to get through? Gameplay. Self-explanatory there. The theme. Does it shine through the game? Or could this game have been themed just about anything? And or does the theme evoke you to want to play the game? And then finally, it factor. How much do you really want to play that game? I'm going to jazz you to get it right back to the table. Uh -huh. um, we go to a 1 to 5 grading scale. We allow ourselves 0.5s, 0.1s, all we wish. Then we total that up, multiply 4, and multiply it by 4, and that gives us our official 417 Gamer score. Mm -hmm. Andrea, starting with presentation, what do you think about Beacon Patrol? It's a tile laying game. Um, so once you get all the tiles out, it looks pretty good. But until you get the tiles laid, there's not much to see. <laughs> um, so if someone's walking by the table, they're probably not going to be drawn into this big, beautiful board with lots of beautiful minis, that, you know, um, much like other games like Carcassonne. It's not going to look or have a table presence until the very end. Uh, the box pretty generic it's a smaller box about half the size of a say an arc nova or an isle of cats um, which makes it easier to fit in the game bag and travel around um, but i would give it oh i'd say a, a three okay uh, for me i give this just a little bit stronger uh, this is a little 20 dollar game and you were right the box is small fits on the shelf but it's not going to be fighting for my big box games. Uh, you know, it's not going to be fighting for Terraforming Mars mm -hmm. or uh, Art Nova or anything like that. It's going to be fighting on the shelf with games like Patchwork. Mm. It's going to... Uh, Agricola All Creatures Big and Small is a similar box size. And same thing on the retail shelves. That's about where it's going to sit. Mm -hmm. For a $20 game, I think the box looks cute. I like the art. We'll get more into the, the, the components and the artwork here sh soon. I think the box shows up on the shelf. So when I'm looking at it, it draws my eye. Mm -hmm. uh, I do agree with you on the components. It's a tile laying game. And those either the people that like tile laying games, they will look at that and know exactly what it is. And those that don't may just walk right by it. So I'm going to go a 375 because I, I like it a little more, bit more. But, yeah, it's, it's, it's cute. It's, it, it does what it does. Mm -hmm. And for a little $20 game, I'm happy with it. Uh, components. Uh, tiles are nice, chunky tiles. Uh, it's glossy compared to, I kind of feel like, well, I guess the earlier Carcassonne is kind of flat. That's flat matte type finish where the new one's a little glossier. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you think about the components? Um, like you said, they're, they're good weighted tiles um they're nice and chunky um we've played this many many times and for a 20 dollars game i mean they're still holding up there's oh, no yeah. scratches they don't bend um they're not scuffed around the corners and we played it on some shady tables mm -hmm. and also you have the little boat minis that move around they're cute rule book was easy to get through mm -hmm. none of that we we read it uh haven't missed a rule and in the base box, they give you two mini expansions along with. Mm -hmm. So you can play it absolutely plain Jane easy for family. Or if you just need a little more complication just to give you, you know, just a little more challenge. Yeah. They throw in the windmills and they throw the piers mini expansions in there. Yeah, so there's two different expansions in the box. You can play with one or both. Yep. So I really enjoy that as far as components that you have the base game. And Carcassonne's now done this, mm -hmm. where the farmers was already a rule in the old game, but now they've made it an optional rule. Because when you're playing the holiday with families, my mom and my grandma might not, or grandpa or uncles and aunts that aren't gamers, mm -hmm. might not understand what the farmer is. And when you have no points in the game, but your farmers end up racing past them, they might be thinking that, oh, they just stole the game from me. Because, you know, they didn't understand what the farmer is. Right. Now the farmer is an optional rule. You just play straight up and play plain Jane. This is similar. But this is cooperative. So, you you know, you don't have to throw in the peers if you think it's too complicated. Or if it's just too much to think about with your family. If they mm -hmm. just want just something they can throw in front of them to where they don't have to think a lot. Yeah. I like this. I'm going to put this at, at a flat four on components. Mm, that's... I, I'd probably do a 3.75. Okay. Gameplay. 
It's a cooperative tie a lane game. Mm -hmm. You also have three propellers that can give you optional moves. Whenever you play a tile, um, as long as it, you connect water to water, your boat moves onto the next tile. Mm -hmm. uh, it, and that's the only way you can connect tiles. You cannot cl connect land to your land tile because the boat can't move across land. Right. I really enjoy the cooperative gameplay, but, and I have a problem with this too, is there is a quarterbacking issue with this game where you guys are working together to try and play the game and get the best score possible. Mm -hmm. And I absolutely love teaching this game and playing with friends and family. And I do, I'm like, oh, but, you know, there's, mm, and I have a problem with quarterbacking. You know, if you put that piece there and that piece there, then you can get around to me and then I can. Yeah. So in the gameplay, you uh, you have three tiles in a one two, or in a two or three player game. Mm -hmm. In a four-player game, you just have two tiles. How? But on your turn, you may swap one of your tiles with another player. So if you have a tile that you flat out cannot play, or if they have a tile that sets uh, up the board to look way cooler and, and uh, surround a better tile, you can you can uh, swap it. Mm -hmm. Because any tile that has basically nothing on it, it's worth one point if it's uh, discovered. And discovered is, as I said at the beginning... A tile on all four sides. Yeah. A tile that has a beacon on it, if it's surrounded, it's worth two points. And then the lighthouses are the hardest because they're connected to land. So you're going to have to have a couple... You basically going to have to do a lot of water tiles to surround it to get it uh, discovered. Mm -hmm. But uh, the lighthouses are worth three points. Um, Gameplay-wise, for a tile lane game, cooperative, I have to knock it down because... My own fault for quarterbacking so much, but mm -hmm. this is... I'm putting this at a four and a quarter. I still love playing this game. Yeah. Um, I'll give, a, give it a 4.0. We have... Um, we've tried playing this game where we both go in the same direction. We try going in uh, separate directions. Um, you know, I'll get the north, then you get the south, and we've tried... Well, that didn't work, so we're like, well, let's next time we'll try and stay together so we can surround each other and... Um, but yeah, we've tried playing it several different ways. Uh, the, it's all fun both ways. Um, I give it a 4.0. Okay. Theme. Um, Andrew, what is the theme? Oh, it's very, very solid. You're connecting water to water so you can sail your boat around. <laughs> Nothing, um, too complicated about that. That's very solid, straightforward. Um, you're sailing a boat and I'll give it a, a 3.75. 3.75. This is where I'm going to be down from you. It's a tile lane game. Yeah. You could have been... Uh, um, could have been hikers going through the forest trying to discover trails. Yeah. You could have been ranchers trying to discover um, um, pastures for your cattle. with, And instead of the islands, that could have been forests because your cows can't go into the forest because sure. of the risks. This could have been... Uh, snowboarding. You could have been finding different paths in the snow to snowboard. And this could have been several other things. So I'm I'm probably at a 3.5 on this. Okay. Which, it, it's, it's not a bad score. It's just not as strong theme-wise as I think other games are. Yeah, and, and I guess there's not a whole lot of thematic tile-laying games. There's Trailblazers that I want to play where you're... You're like looking for Bigfoot and you're making trails. Uh, so maybe that's why that's in my head. I'm like, oh, this could have been themed several other things. Yeah. But, eh, yeah, I'm going to keep it at a 375. So that brings us to It Factor. Andrea, what is It Factor? Um, The how desperate are you to play it again? Yeah. Um, I think that you have asked to play it more than I have asked to play it. Um, which is normally the other way around. If I've got a game that I'm really into, I'm the one who's like, let's play it again, again, again. Um, so I'm just going to go um, 3.25 for me. I enjoy the game, but it's not something that I'm going to be like, oh, let's play it twice in a row yeah. kind of a game. Uh, I'm at a 4.25 on this. Yeah. I'm yeah. not a big solo gamer. Mm -hmm. This is one of the few games, uh, while... Just waiting for things to happen. Maybe you were in the shower or 
when we had our trip in Florida where everybody else was sleeping and I couldn't sleep or I woke up early, I pulled this out and I played solo a couple times. Nice. And I don't play solo games hardly ever. So for this, and even after all that, it's still in our bag to go out to the game that yeah. we've been going out to. Yeah. And, you know, I pulled it out and a couple times you'd be like, hey, what about something else? And I'm like, okay, we can play something else. <laughs> but for something to really stay with me that much, mm-hmm. I've got to give it a high score. Now, a month or two or even a year from now, That'll probably go down a bit. Sure. And that's what the it factor is. Right now, how much do you want to play it? So my it factor, you know, it's up there more than yours is. Mm-hmm. But so uh, I had a presentation. I had a 3.75. Andrew was at a 3. For components, I was at a 4. Andrew's at a 3.75. Gameplay, I'm at a 4.25. Andrew's at a 4. Yep, uh, let's see here. Theme, I'm at a 3.5. Andrew's at a 3.75. It factor, Andrew's at three and a quarter. I'm at four and a quarter. We take that total. Mine is 19.75. Andrew's is 17.75. We multiply that by four for our official 417 gamer score for Beacon Patrol. Andrea, you have it at a 71. Hmm. And I have it at a 79. Oh, wow. Quite a bit of a difference. Yeah, bit of a difference. But I think that's kind of where we are with it. Yeah, I agree. It's in the bag because I have it in the bag. And then we have Point City in the bag, which we might review, who knows, pretty soon. (laughs) We have that in the bag because you want it in the bag. Right. But that was uh, Beacon Patrol, published by Pandasaur Games, uh, designed and the artist by Torben Ratzlaff. So I'll, I'll give a, a final um, note that it's not terribly difficult. I would put definitely put it in the lighter game um, yeah, on the show. Family weight, definitely a, a family weight game. So if you guys are looking for something quick and easy to that you could take to a holiday get together, I I would definitely give it a higher um, re- score in that I area. I definitely put this in the gateway family. Yeah. So when you're thinking of the Splendors, you're thinking of the Ticket to Rides, Mm -hmm. this is absolutely, if you're giving this out at the the Christmas season, Mm -hmm. thinking of gifts, give it as a gift, especially if you're there, teach them up real quick, and let them have fun with it. Yeah. So, that is Beacon Patrol by Pandasaurus Games. Let's go on to the next segment. See you then. You heard it earlier, Geekmas 2023 is coming! It's going to happen December 2nd and 3rd at the Fairbanks on the north side of Springfield. Proceeds benefit the Drew Lewis Foundation. Admission for attendees is absolutely free. Come out, enjoy cosplay, gaming, comics, artists, and more! Geekmas 2023, be there! As usual, the 7, the 417 Gamers, is our 7 list. This is the expansion episode. Mr. Greg, say hello. Hello, everyone. In the previous episode 14, we talked about Game Night and their favorite 7 games in the bag. We had you come on to this expansion episode to tell us what your favorite games were flat out. So... You want to go... Are they in in any order? They're not in any particular order. All right. Hit us with your first... Of your favorite seven games. Okay. Um, games that just have a... Most of them have a story behind them. But my first one I'm going to say is Planet Unknown. This one's a recent edition. I didn't get in on the original Kickstarter or the first print run. I actually picked this copy up at this last Gen Con. But it was long overdue. I played somebody's copy of it at one of the metagames nights. And had an absolute blast. It's got the... It's got the terraforming theme of, like, terraforming Mars. It's less heavy, and uh, it's got the benefit of everyone taking their turns at the same time, and Mm -hmm. so it goes uh, faster in that way. And with all the... Once people have played their first game, you can flip the boards and have different corporations terraforming different planets, and there's so much replay value, and the art is good. Uh, it took me a couple 
plays to realize, but every corporation, their rovers, the illustration of the rovers is different on each corporation. Mm. And the the flip sides of the planet boards are so different. You've got Cerberus, which is three different planets clustered together. You've got the planet that has a a crag going down the middle, and you can't play tiles that cross that crag. I was lucky enough to have the corporation that learns how to move their uh, rovers diagonally, mm-hmm. and the the the, law, the letter of the law says you cannot move rovers orthogonally across that line. So I was able to work around that. So the more you play games, the more you find interesting combinations. Uh, and if a game is well designed to have replay value, you find those little tricks and twists. Yeah. Your number or number two. Uh, my number two is Action Cats. It's a party game, and I don't get to play those uh, often enough. I'm not a huge. I like Cards Against Humanity well enough. It really depends on which people I'm playing with, because some mm-hmm. of them can get really rowdy or rude about it, mm-hmm. and there are s- subjects of conversation that I just prefer to ignore altogether. Mm-hmm. Action Cats is is tame. It's by Keith Baker, and I love him. I've met him at several conventions. I'll sing his praise from the highest hill. (laughs) And I'm also very biased in that when I backed the Kickstarter, everyone who backed the Kickstarter at a certain level could submit photos of their own cats with a chance that they would be included in the game. And I am lucky enough to have my cat Jericho in the base game and the... uh, Gaming Cats, the Gamer Cats expansion. Nice. Oh, that's awesome. So I get to show that. That's in my uh, brewery game night bag every time. And if anybody asks about it, I'll be like, okay, yeah, here's how the game plays. By the way, my cat's in it. Look, look, look. <laughs> that's amazing. Uh, number three. Uh, number three, Cartographer. Hmm. It, ha- it has a maximum player count of question marks. I bought uh, packs of uh, markers uh, just to give it some color, just so people Colored could... Colored pencils, we did mm-hmm. say. Colored pencils, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, my friend David uh, got like a, one of those 64-pack like, Crayola colored pencil sets uh, because it's fun. You get to make a map, uh, and uh, you also get to add your own spin on it. I have this wild dream that I'm probably never going to fulfill of doing a not necessarily a D&D campaign but some fantasy role playing campaign where we start by playing cartographer and then every character has a map that they made and then they have to figure out whose map is accurate at what points hmm. like kingmaker but everybody thinks they already know what the region looks like yeah oh that's cool uh, uh number four yeah. Uh, number four, uh, another party game, Noisy Person Cards. Hmm. Um, it is, again, tying it into tabletop role-playing games. Uh, the One Shot Podcast Network, I think their printing company is called Paracosm Press, mm-hmm. um, kickstarted it, and instead of telling lewd jokes like in Cards Against Humanity, you make funny character voices. And so the judge will lay down a card uh, like uh, Vampire or Part-Time Worker or Pixie, And then each player has a hand of cards with quotes on them, and your job is to pick which card you think is funniest and read that quote in that voice. Hmm. And every card, every quote card on the flip side has a modifier for the voice. So if there's a tie, if I think you two both did a really good vampire read Uh and I can't decide who won... I can add a modifier to that vampire and have you two read again with a modifier. And so, okay, you both did a pretty good vampire. How about a vampire with a Wisconsin accent? <laughs> I think we should get that game. Yeah. <laughs> it's wicked hard to get now. You can still get it. They sold the license to Mattel and they reskinned it to be more family accessible mm-hmm. instead of being pretty hardcore marketing to the D&D group. Yeah. So if you can find the original fantasy version, it's probably pretty hard to find because they, it was just the Kickstarter run. Ah. Um, but I have it, so I'd be happy to bring it sometime. Yeah, right. absolutely. Number five. Number five is uh, Tokaido. I I like uh, when I can't get a uh, cooperative game going, 
I'll settle for a chill, indirectly competitive game. And <laughs> Takedo is famously the hurry up and wait game where you you move from uh, destination to destination along this road through Japan and you're visiting souvenir shops, restaurants, hot baths, and collecting points. It's a bit of a point salad game where insofar as every location you visit is going to get you points, except for the one place that gets you just money. But money turns into points later. So you're always working towards something, um, but there's limited spots on each location to occupy. So you can rush ahead to the place that you really want to be, but then you're possibly missing some other opportunities. So there's always interesting choices to be made because your opponents and whoever is the furthest back on the road takes the next turn. It's not mm -hmm. always player one, player two, player three in that yeah. order forever. I, I like the set building elements. I like that each character has different powers and I got, I managed to get a copy of the deluxe version. So I've got sculpted minis that I will get around to painting one day. Once, <laughs> once, once I finish painting Pandemic Reign of Cthulhu, My Father's uh, Word, Power Rangers Heroes of the Grid, etc., etc., etc. I'll just do the just do Takedo. <laughs> uh, number six. Uh, number six, uh, Red Dragon Inn. Hmm. It's it's sort of a party game, but there is mechanics to it, and uh, there's enough characters that that's another one of those games I can play over and over again, and find uh, new ways to fudge with the mechanics for a different character, or even just having one character versus another character. Like, how does the paladin, how does the angry orc paladin interact with the cheating bard? Or how does the bard interact in interesting ways with the druid who can shift between three different forms? Uh, I have turned the game into a full-on drinking game at one point. <laughs> I, I made a list and assigned, like, okay, if... And this was all optional. Nobody was obligated to drink. But, like, if you choose to partake, elven wine. Oh, you take a shot of... I, here's a crap. bottle of red uh, fruit wine. Or uh, dragon's breath ale. Here's a shot of fireball. Things like that. And... How'd that, that go? Um, it went, it went really well. Some of us remembered more than others. <laughs> but, no, That's that was great. my... I think that was my 28th birthday. And uh, that was what we did that evening... And it just just had a blast. Just nice. Yeah, it's it's one of those games where even if you get just massacred, you're still having a good time because there's a strong comedy element and you're with friends. I think we had eight players for that game. Yeah. Which is still very reasonable for that game. It does it does drag on because only one person's taking their turn at a time. Mm -hmm. But we're cracking wise, we're having drinks, just having a good time. Nice. Very cool. And Seven. I know you can only have seven, seven but what's number seven? Uh, seven is, uh, if I may get a little sentimental, I have not played this game in at least 25 years, but I'm going to say Old Maid. Oh. Wow. My earliest memories of tabletop gaming mm -hmm. are of myself and my grandmother in oh. her apartment. And when my parents uh, had to work late, because both my parents uh, are retired uh, music teachers... Uh, when they had to go to a conference or when they had to work late and uh, I needed to be supervised, uh, they would send me to my grandmother's home Aww. and uh, we would uh, have dinner and uh, play a card game or watch Wheel of Fortune. Uh, apparently, Vanna White was my first ever English teacher. <laughs> yeah. um, but that's those are my earliest memories of just learning how how different elements interact uh, yeah. be before I understood what mechanics or tricks were or anything, any of the terms that we take for granted, sure. I was the, the beginnings of figuring out how to solve puzzles and, and gauge risk were building. And, and besides all that, just spending time with people you love Performing an activity that doesn't really matter, but you're doing it because you like doing it. Yeah. And because you want that quality time. That's awesome. That's a great way to end it. 
<laughs> well, Greg, thank you for coming on. Thank you for having uh, me. You gave us your social medias in the last episode, but mm-hmm. if you don't mind, uh, maybe give them to us again. Certainly. Uh, my I am primarily on Instagram and Discord. My Instagram is Queen City Cardboard, all one word, no capital letters. Okay. And my Discord is the abbreviation QCC for Queen City Cardboard, but I try to make kind of an automatopoeia of it, so it is Q U C I C I one nine eight five. All right. Q C C nineteen eighty five. Thank you very much for coming on. We'll see you later in the four one seven. And everybody else, keep gaming. Take care, everyone. Four one seven. The 417 Gamer Podcast is recorded and produced by Rick Bagwell and Andrea Smith. We want to thank Greg Pullman for stopping by. Don't forget to hit him up on the Instagrams at Queen City Cardboard. The intro music we use, kind, gentle, beautiful person, and the outro music, Making Up for Lost Time, was created by Origami Reptica. For links to that music and our show notes, head over to our Facebook page at facebook.com forward slash hobby gaming network. Follow the 417 Gamers on Instagram at 417 Gamers. But until then, keep gaming in the 417.